Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 190 of Humanity Rising. I want to note as we uh, begin today uh, that uh, yesterday uh, the United States marked the 500,000th death due to COVID. As President Biden remarked in the commemoration of this uh, yesterday evening in Washington, D.C., that is more than the amount of uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers that were killed in World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War combined. The United States uh, has, as Dr. Fauci commented yesterday, the worst record of any country in the world on the uh, pandemic. 4% uh, of the human population, and depending on estimates, 20 to 25% of all the cases uh, and the hospitalizations and the deaths. Uh, and yet, the COVID pandemic is affecting everyone everywhere in different kinds of ways. Uh, and the experiments and the approaches that different countries have utilized uh, over the past year uh, have been very different from one another. Uh, but the uh, pandemic in virtually every country has persisted. Uh, and uh, now new variants uh, have uh, emerged. Vaccinations are now being deployed. Uh, there's much speculation as to uh, efficacy, uh, much controversy. So we thought that over the next couple of days, uh, we would delve into uh, the pandemic uh, and have a discussion that hopefully will illuminate all of us on the scope and nature of the pandemic, which we'll get into today, uh, uh, tomorrow uh, on uh, the capacities we have to in improve and increase and bolster our immune systems. Uh, and then on Thursday on the whole domain of public health uh, in relationship to the pandemic. So we have a lot in store. Uh, the pandemic has uh, influenced each and every one of us uh, and collectively in a way that uh, has permanently uh, changed our world. But before we uh, launch into our program today, I think it's a good idea that let's just take a pause as we always do as we commence Humanity Rising Take a few deep breaths, settle into your body, close your eyes, and listen to your heartbeat. Center your attention on your heart. And for the next 60, 90 seconds, attune yourself to your heartbeat and that of those around you in the spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving. Thank you, everyone. 
And now with an open heart and a heart full of gratitude for each and every one of you uh, who has joined our session today, I want to welcome uh, Dr. Chris Byrer, uh, who will be joining us for a dialogue on the scope and nature of the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Breyer is a, a very distinguished uh, inaugural Desmond Tutu Professor in Public Health and Human Rights at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. He's a professor of epidemiology, international health, health behavior and society, nursing and medicine at Johns Hopkins. He serves as director of the Johns Hopkins training program in HIV epidemiology and prevention science and is founding director of the Center for Public Health and Human Rights. He's also an associate director of the Johns Hopkins Center for AIDS Research uh, and of the University Center for Global Health. Uh, he has extensive experience in conducting international collaborative research and he spent much of his career focusing on health and human rights. Uh, he was the president of the International AIDS Society from 2014 to 2016 and was elected to membership in the National Academy of Medicine in 2014. And he currently serves as senior scientific liaison to the COVID-19 vaccine prevention network. Uh, so Chris, it's a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you uh, for a discussion uh, at this moment when the United States has passed the 500,000 death uh, milestone um, to talk about uh, the pandemic. I would say one year on, it was a year ago this month that the first COVID case mm -hmm. hit the United States and most countries. But I'd like to start at a more personal level, just so people can get a feel for who Chris Byrer is uh, uh, underneath all these accolades of uh, educational and, and medical achievements. Would love to have you just share a little bit about your life, what led you into medicine, how you got involved with the, the, the AIDS uh, uh, work with such passion and, and ongoing commitment and, and the scope of your uh, the medical interest and, and activities at the present moment. Then we can dive into uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the issues pertaining to the pandemic. Okay, well, first of all, Jim, it's, a, it's wonderful to be here. And uh, hello, everyone out there in, the, in our virtual pandemic space. This is, this is our new normal, as we all know. And, uh, and I also have to say, I, I'm, I'm very, um, I was very moved. I'm very glad that you began with that acknowledgement uh, of the loss because uh, it has been extraordinary. It's of course not over. Uh, and the fact that, you know, we have such phenomenal scientific capacity, which is evidenced in the vaccine development, which I've been very active with um, and had such a disastrous response, uh, really speaks volumes. Um, but I, I started uh, early on in life um, following a, quite a different path. I was very interested in Buddhism as a young man. Um, actually traveled in Ladakh with Andrew Harvey, uh -huh. uh, who wrote that wonderful book, uh, A Journey in Ladakh. And we, we were there in the early 80s. Uh, and I thought that that was perhaps going to be my path. Um, uh, and I had aspirations to be a writer. Uh, and in Ladakh, actually, um, I was taking teachings with a wonderful man named Drukchen Rinpoche, his holiness, the, uh, the 13th Gwalya Drukpa. Uh, and he kept asking me, um, when is it you're going back to the U.S. to go to medical school? And I kept saying, I'm not really thinking of that. <laughs> but eventually, uh, I got the message. And uh, I had always been interested in, in the body and in science and, and had actually studied biology in college and Asian history. Um, and uh, so I came back to the States and uh, embarked on that medical journey. And I'm a gay man. Um, and I walked into uh, the AIDS wards of New York City in 1984 um, as a medical student. And there really wasn't any choice about whether or not any of us wanted to be involved in HIV. It was overwhelming. Uh, 
uh, city at the time. I was in um, the, the only public medical school in New York is SUNY Downstate in East Flatbush, Brooklyn, uh, which was really an epicenter. Oh, that was an epicenter. Oh, let me tell you. And we also, we had the prison ward. So it was the only place, you know, the guys from Rikers Island and women from the women's prisons and jails when they got sick also came there. Um, so, you know, medical students spent a lot of time there. Um, and at the time, my partner was a wonderful young man. who was an actor, gone to Juilliard, uh, just, a, mm -hmm. just an amazing guy. And as I you know, was learning more and understanding more of what was going on, I started to realize uh, that he almost certainly was progressing with this new disease. And uh, so we were together through my medical school internship residency at Hopkins. He died just as I was finishing my training um, of uh, Kaposi's sarcoma, um, which was untreatable at the time. And uh, I really didn't know what I was gonna do next. And I stopped medicine for a while and I was trying to finish a book that he had written and I got an offer uh, to go to Thailand that Hopkins had gotten a grant to start, uh, set up the infrastructure to do HIV vaccine trials in Northern Thailand, a place I'd never been. I'd been in India and Nepal and Ladakh, but never Southeast Asia. So um, I thought that's something I can do. And I moved there and I started working on, on what was the worst HIV epidemic in Asia at the time by far in Thailand. Um, and then also working in the neighboring countries, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, taught in Malaysia, Southern China, Yunnan, Guangxi, uh, and also in what was then called Burma, then it became Myanmar. Joe Biden just turned it back to Burma, by the way, after this recent coup. And there I really started to see how uh, more open and democratic and just societies, which Thailand was at the time, it isn't now, uh, were able to really vigorously respond to the HIV epidemic and countries like Burma, which was under a harsh military rule, were just hobbled and couldn't respond. Uh, and, and the epidemics were really out of control. Um, and uh, that really led to my thinking on, on human rights. I, I came back to the US in 1997 uh, to take over the international training program at Hopkins. And then uh, that led very directly within months uh, to my really having to spend time in Africa and travel all over Africa and really understand the devastation of the epidemic there. Um, and I continue to work in, in a number of countries. I have projects right now in South Africa, Malawi. And then uh, I got involved in, in Russia, uh, which was also having an explosive epidemic. I spent many years working there and in, in the stands, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, um, China, uh, India, uh, Brazil, uh, and, uh, and eventually, uh, you know, have, have sort of, as so many people in my field have done uh, with this second pandemic, just had to pivot very quickly uh, to, to COVID. And um, when it was announced last spring that the NIH was going to have to do five clinical trials of COVID vaccines with at least 30,000 people each uh, <laughs> to get to a, to a COVID vaccine, we had never done anything on that scale and certainly not in HIV and, and never with, with that time pressure and urgency. Um, the, the government asked for volunteers. I was on a call organizing these trials and, and uh, people said, we just don't have the bandwidth and we don't have the people. So anybody would like to jump in here. And I just immediately thought, oh, I have to do that. Um, and so I've been working 50% time since then uh, on the COVID vaccine trials and really working on the aspect of community engagement, community participation and trying to engage um, the most affected communities, which have been African-Americans, Latinx Americans, Native Americans, uh, people in uh, detention, prison and jails. Uh, uh, and, um, and it has been remarkable to see how well uh, the vaccine development and the clinical trials have gone 
but again, incredibly frustrating at how uh, how badly the public health aspects of all of this and the rollout have gone. And I should say that um, I was fortunate in my life to, um, when I came back to the States to um, find another partner. And I was with a, a wonderful man who was a nurse practitioner here in Baltimore for 22 years. And then really very mysteriously uh, at 53, um, perfectly healthy man, he developed a, a combination of a hospital acquired pneumonia. He worked in a, in a Jewish hospital here in town, Sinai, <clears throat> influenza. And uh, he was gone in three days. Wow. This was in April of 2019. And he actually died of exactly what people who die of COVID die of, which is most of them, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And we had the whole thing, you know, the intubation, the having to be prone for oxygenation, uh, the heart-lung bypass, uh, ECMO it's called, uh, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, the full on, and we couldn't save them. And so I've been really in, in grief and grieving and trying to, to work through this. And so for those half a million people who died, I, we all feel for them, but I, I feel a certain <laughs> uh, really mm -hmm. unity with the survivors um, uh, and people who've lost loved ones. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, two pandemics uh, in my career and uh, two, uh, two magnificent men uh, lost. Wow. So you've really lived, lived this up close and personal, as they say, in a in a way that that has has left uh, kind of wounds and trauma uh, as a result. So I just want to acknowledge that. I I wonder, Chris, a good place to begin would be to just get your reflections on the relationship between the AIDS kind of pandemic and the, and the COVID pandemic. Because uh, you've been through two now, what what have been your learnings? What uh, what what wisdom have you gleaned from dealing with the um, the two scourges yeah. that, that have afflicted us? Well, I have to say, you know, one of the first uh, lessons globally that we we ought to have learned from AIDS and we didn't, um, which has happened again, is that. These are both, uh, of course, viral uh, pandemics that are zoonoses. These uh, are animal viruses that have crossed from the host species, which tolerate them, generally speaking, uh, probably through, in both cases, a transitional species uh, that gets them closer to us biologically, so they're more closely adapted. And then to humans, and in both cases, this is because of habitat destruction, wildlife trafficking, hunting, uh, and really the destruction of, uh, of rainforest wilderness areas. Um, and you would have thought with the first SARS outbreak uh, some years ago, and then the MERS outbreak, that people would have learned the lesson of leaving bats alone. <laughs> And not eating bats, not trafficking bats, not mixing wild animals, rainforest animals from Southeast Asia in this case, or from West and Central Africa in the case of uh, chimpanzees, um, which is the intermediate host species for HIV. HIV is a, is a monkey virus from indigenous monkey species in, in West and Central Africa. And chimpanzees got that virus because male chimpanzees hunt monkeys and eat them. Uh, and uh, of course they're our closest primate relative and they are carnivorous uh, uh, well, or omnivorous, uh, unlike gorillas and, and orangutans and gibbons who are all vegans. They are vegan species, but chimpanzees hunt and they hunt meat. And, uh, and so SIV crossed into chimps and then it crossed into humans from bushmeat hunting. In the case of, of SARS-CoV-2, the, the coronavirus that has caused this COVID pandemic, 
Uh, it's a bat virus. We, we knew that early on. It's closely related to several other bat coronaviruses, including the first SARS. And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is a, a, an outcome of, as I said, wildlife trafficking, habitat destruction. Climate change has also played a role. There was a very important paper just out in Science about how uh, the number and the diversity of bat species in Southeast Asia has been increasing because of climate change that favors them. Uh, and bats are very unique mammals that have, because of the, the physiology of flight, uh, what is the equivalent of an inflammatory response all the time would be for other mammals, but they handle it very well and they can handle these coronaviruses. Uh, we can't as we are abundantly <laughs> living through. Uh, so those, those similarities are really there. Um, I think what's been so striking with the COVID epidemic in the United States is that, you know, we have known now for 40 years, and by the way, this year, 2021 is the 40th anniversary of the discovery of HIV, which of course was identified in clusters of gay men in LA, San Francisco, and New York in June of 1981 in that famous MMWR from the CDC, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. So we're coming up on that 40th, we are on the 40th anniversary. Um, but it took many years for HIV to move through human populations and to start to show us how it could end up being in marginalized communities and in people excluded from healthcare services. And HIV in the US right now is increasingly a disease of the South and Southeast, of African Americans, Latinx Americans, of sexual and gender minorities, um, in, in women, about 25% of new infections in this country are in women. It is overwhelmingly an infection of Black and Latinx women. And it is overwhelmingly an infection in the states that have refused to expand Medicaid through the Affordable Care Act. It's, it's when you look at the map of HIV in the United States, it is the map of syphilis. It's what used to be called the Cotton Belt. It's a stretch from Texas across Florida the Carolinas, all the way up to Baltimore and Washington, DC. And we saw that happen so quickly again with COVID. It just overwhelmingly, you know, became uh, such higher rates uh, of disease and death in African Americans, Latin Americans, Native Americans. And people want, you know, wonder why that is, and there's a lot of thinking out there. We looked at this very carefully. We've published on it quite a bit. And it's abundantly clear that, that it's really social determinants of health. The first thing is that Blacks and Latinx people in this country are so much less likely to be able to work from home. Only one in five Blacks can work from home, only one in six Latinos. The undocumented don't have that choice at all. Uh, people are in crowded multi-generational housing they're much less likely to have a private provider. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, uh, all of those factors come together. Uh, they, they have kept this country going while, while you know, the middle class and upper class folks have been able to stay at home and stay safe. Um, and uh, they've paid a terrible price for it. Amazing, I had, I had not uh, known of the uh, kind of the demographic overlap of AIDS and COVID. Mm -hmm. It's quite extraordinary. That's, yeah. that, that's quite extraordinary. So that the 500,000 uh, would be reflecting that demographic uh, concentration. That's right, that's right. And you know, right now, I mean, we're, we're in a, of course, happily this terrible midwinter peak has, has come down. It's come down in many places. But if you look at Baltimore City right now, there's really one zip code that accounts for most of the hospitalizations and most of the deaths. And that is our neighborhood that is uh, basically home to a, the majority of, of the folks who are uh, undocumented migrants, um, mostly uh, Spanish speaking, only Spanish speaking or speaking indigenous languages uh, from Guatemala. Uh, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, and Mexico. And, uh, and these are folks who uh, not only cannot work from home, we usually need to work every day and have been keeping, keeping us all going here, but also uh, live in very crowded housing um, and uh, can't socially distance even at home. 
and also are afraid to seek health care because of their undocumented status. And uh, they don't show up until they can't breathe. And so the mortality is, and can't work. Uh, the mortality rates are much higher because they're coming in too late. Wow. Let me uh, uh, circle back to the origins. Uh, there was a, a comment uh, uh, by Richard Page here that the chief researcher at Wuhan has explained that the bats were dormant at the time of the first Wuhan uh, COVID-19 cases in humans. Uh, and I know that there's uh, been uh, evidence and speculation that it was uh, uh, released from a lab. That the the there's a you know contracts between the CDC and Wuhan labs around uh, experimentation in viruses for you know biological weapons research and so forth and so on. What's what's your understanding, Chris, of the origins of the COVID-19 uh, in Wuhan. How do yeah. you understand what happened? Yeah, yeah. Well, the first thing to say is there still is some uncertainty about the emergence, right? Right. And of course, Wuhan uh, is a big uh, polluted industrial city, right? It's actually uh, China's uh, kind of New Jersey because it's the center of their pharmaceutical industry and they are the largest producer and exporter of fentanyl, which is causing, of course, a huge amount of overdose deaths in the United States. So there are no bats there. There's no wildlife there. That, that, that is not what is happening. Uh, there was a, uh, a virology lab that, um, uh, and this was really set up uh, largely in response to the first SARS outbreak, which is 11 years ago. Um, and this was set up in collaboration with some very good researchers, including uh, the Eco Health Alliance, you may have heard of them, um, uh, who were working on uh, these bat coronaviruses. And it is very appropriate to be doing research on bat coronaviruses. It needs to be done. Uh, of course, you know, we're, we were concerned about the reemergence of, of a SARS uh, and then the MERS, the Middle Eastern uh, Respiratory uh, Syndrome emerged um, and is still circulating. It's another bat coronavirus. It's much less infectious uh, than either of the other two. Uh, and interestingly, it emerged again from bats, but it appears to have an intermediate host in camels. And, uh, and so it, it has been really confined to some extent to the Middle East and North Africa um, where bats, humans and camels interact. So, uh, and we should remember that Ebola uh, is also a bat virus. It's another virus that bats tolerate and that uh, great apes uh, get sick and die from and as of course so do humans and we're seeing another Ebola outbreak. So, you know, it, it isn't at all surprising. The, the, the challenges here are, first of all, uh, this, these wet markets in China very often mix wild animals with domestic animals. So you have, you know, large numbers of pigs and chickens, mm -hmm. ducks, and all of those animals, and also exotics that are mostly trafficked. Um, uh, the remaining wildlife areas uh, where these animals live in China is mostly in Yunnan province so on the border with Burma and Laos, Guangxi province on the border with Vietnam. Uh, I've worked in both places. I know them well. And, but most of these animals are not from there. They are trafficked out of uh, Burma for the most part and Laos and Vietnam, Cambodia. And actually, uh, some years ago, uh, in the late 90s, I was working on a documentary on heroin in the region with Channel 4, the British, um, British uh, television channel. And uh, there was a connection between uh, the poppy growing heroin cultivation in northern Burma, which at the time was the world's largest producer. Now it's been superseded by Afghanistan tragically enough. But at the time, Burma was the largest producer of heroin exporter. Uh, and this was very connected, as it turned out, to both weapons trafficking and wildlife trafficking. Uh, and so we ended up going, uh, at that time, you could pay five bucks to the border guards and go illegally into northern Burma, uh, which we did covertly, I must say. <laughs> and uh, this is 1998, I think, or nine. Um, 
and went into a small trading town, Tai Chi Lek, uh, Shan place, the Shan ethnic group in Northern Burma, uh, into what was then the largest wildlife market in Southeast Asia. And it was just unbelievable. I walked into one stall, there were the pelts and parts, bones and other parts of 40 clouded leopards. And a clouded leopard is a rare animal. It's a, it's a uh, rainforest predator that is a canopy hunter of birds and monkeys. And when you see 40 pelts, that means an enormous area of forest has been cleared, clear cut. And that also was going on. Uh, but the place was just full of uh, hornbill skulls, rhino horn, uh, bear bile, tiger parts, all of these animals. And, and as Jane Goodall has pointed out, animals that often don't live near each other and that are all brought into these places. There was only one living animal in this market. It was a small thing. It sort of looked like a weasel or a ferret. I didn't really know what it was, but I bought it um, because it was alive and I thought we could rescue it. And we carried it out into the forest uh, above this uh, town and released it uh, and filmed the release. And then we looked at the footage when we actually could you know, figure out what it was. And it's a little animal called the Burmese ferret badger. Um, now that it's interesting because the ferret is an animal that we use to study respiratory viral transmission. So, you know, I was in a Jeep with that animal for over an hour uh, and it was frantic and in this cage and very upset and thought it was going to be killed. Um, and, you know, you realize, okay, if that animal had been carrying one of these exotic respiratory viruses, all of us on that film crew and myself would have been exposed. And that's how these things happen. Right. So we know from viral phylogenetics that this is a bat virus. What we don't know is how it got so well adapted to humans in those early few months, probably sometime in the fall of last year, October, November, certainly by December, that's when the cases really started to appear uh, in Wuhan hospitals. Uh, so it was already there. And virologists early on realized that this was a bat virus, but that it also was already quite adapted to human transmission. We are not sure why that happened. It may be that it had passed through another animal species. Um, it may be uh, that there's, there is some potential that it could have been because uh, they used cell lines in that lab probably almost certainly by mistake, but that, that was part of what the WHO team that was just in Wuhan was trying to investigate. And you probably heard um, you know, that, that Biden administration has very clearly said uh, China stalled that investigation, did not share what we really need, which is the raw data, not their analysis of the data, but the raw data. So I'm, I'm afraid to say the science is not resolved and the jury is still out. Um, we know this is a bat virus. Uh, it's almost certainly from wildlife trafficking uh, and, and into these markets. Um, uh, it may be that there's an intermediate animal species uh, people have thought that it's probably the pangolin, the little scaly little animal that is actually the most trafficked mammal in the world is the pangolin, uh, mostly for the Chinese traditional medicine trade. They use the scales. So we really, you know, we're, it's unresolved. And, and I think it's very unfortunate that, um, that China did not fully participate uh, and that the WHO uh, wasn't able to compel them to do so. Yeah, so the, the origins remain a mystery in a fundamental uh, way. I, yeah, I wouldn't say the origin is a mystery. The origin is, a, is this is a bat virus. How it moved from bats uh, into humans and that early period of adaptation, whether it's through another animal species or, or however it happened, that is not clear. Uh, but when it emerged, as we all know, it was a highly infectious, for humans, much more infectious than, than the first SARS, but with a lower case fatality rate. And it's a, it's a challenging virus because it, it has 
the word that Dr. Fauci used, which I think is exactly right, is protean manifestations. You know, Proteus, the god of multiple forms, right? And and so, uh, you know, you can have completely asymptomatic infection and be infectious for others and not have any symptoms, all the way up to, of course, um, losing your life. Yeah, so that the, 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 the explanation for why it spread so quickly mm -hmm. and powerfully is due to the protean nature of its own versatility. Yeah, and, and it is adapting quickly. That, that's our, our kind of what's keeping people like myself awake at night right now is uh, the emergence of these new variants. Um, some of which appear to uh, have evolved to be more infectious for humans. We're very worried about that with right. the UK variant and the South African variant. Uh, the UK one might also be a little more lethal. It doesn't look like the South African one is. Um, but the other concern is that, um, you know, the, the vaccines that we do have uh, with emergency use authorization um, have been incredibly effective against right, 95 and 94% efficacy against the strain they were developed for, which is, you know, early the, uh, a year ago. I mean, we, we had the sequence uh, in January. The Chinese, uh, Chinese scientists published the sequence online uh, um, in early January, uh, and that was used to make the transcript for these RNA vaccines. Um, so there's, but, you know, it's a year later. And now there may be variants that, um, that are gonna challenge these vaccines. And we may be in a place as we are with influenza where we're gonna need a new SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID-19 vaccine every year, and we're gonna be getting boosters. Wow. You happen. know, it's, it's interesting that as you look back over the year, uh, you know, there was some countries initially, uh, New Zealand, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, that were heralded as the countries that kind of solved it. Mm -hmm. And then the summer uh, occurred. And then in the fall, uh, most of the countries, whatever they had done to ameliorate the pandemic, were experiencing dramatic rises in their cases all over again. So, I mean, as you, as you look back over the last year, Chris, to how countries have been coping Mm. Um, what would be your assessment? What, what, in hindsight, what should the world have done? Well, certainly, um, there's no question that in the early period of the outbreak in Wuhan, uh, you probably know uh, this extraordinary situation with a, a young physician, uh, mm. a man named Li Wenliang, uh, who, an ophthalmologist, 34 years old, um, who saw these patients coming into the hospital and, and was concerned that this looked like SARS, that, that, that SARS was coming back. And he communicated with his medical school classmates, just other physicians uh, on social media saying, I'm worried, is anybody else seeing this? This looks like SARS. These patients are, you know, get hypoxic quickly. They need to be intubated. Uh, and he was detained by the security forces in Wuhan within four days. Uh, he was forced to sign a confession that he uh, was violating social order um, and that he should cease and desist from communicating these false rumors. Uh, and so we lost precious time there. And of course, because we didn't really understand the transmission, and these folks certainly didn't, we know now you know, that, that the amount of virus you're exposed to, we call it the inoculum, the dose of virus, has a very big impact on how seriously ill you get. Uh, and he, of course, even though he's a perfectly healthy 34-year-old man, was not masked, obviously, taking care of patients, intubating patients, and he got an enormous uh, inoculum uh, and died. Um, so uh, those, you know, you never get back the early weeks of a pandemic. <laughs> they really count. And that, that was a real loss. And I don't think that that was Beijing. I've, I've been involved and I've published on what happened with the first SARS in China. Um, this is always a problem in China between the center and the periphery, right? There's an old saying that nobody wants to send the emperor bad news, right? And it's the local authorities 
who, who have enormous power in China, who clamp down and close down and are not evidence-based and haven't learned, you know, the lessons of the past and, and want to keep everything, you know, contained in their area. Um, when Beijing finally got involved, they responded vigorously, but too late. But it's like uh, Governor Cuomo in New York. Yes. The tendency of the local That's magistrates right. in whatever region is to constrain and pretend like nothing really happened uh, for as long as possible. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And also, you know, we, we were, um, we, we had a disastrous public health response, right? So we were worried about China. Um, in the meantime, you know, Italy and France and the UK, of course, particularly Italy at the time, uh, uh, were having enormous outbreaks. And there was a huge amount of movement between New York City and those cities. Uh, and people were being asked, have you been to China? And not, have you been to Rome? <laughs> have you been to Milan? Uh, and, uh, and so, of course, New York City actually was seeded with virus from multiple introductions, and we've sequenced those viruses, and we know that they weren't from China. They were the European variants, mostly Italian and French. Uh, and so we got that completely wrong, and our focus on recent travel to China uh, really hampered us. And the CDC was made terrible decisions uh, about this and kept you know, looking at travel history, uh, when it was already clear there were cases in Seattle of people who had no travel history and no connection to China and were just spontaneously appearing with SARS, including in nursing homes uh, with COVID. Um, so, uh, you know, that early period- Stop you there for a second. You're saying people without any connection in the early stages were spontaneously getting COVID. It, would that suggest that there, there isn't a, a linear relationship between Wuhan and someone in a nursing home in Seattle that they got COVID? How did that transmission happen then? Well, no, what, what I'm saying is that community transmission was already underway. Oh, that, I see. What you mean. That yeah. West Coast outbreak was seeded from Asia. It may not have been directly from Wuhan. By then there were already cases in Thailand and in Singapore and in Hong Kong and, and the cat was out of the bag. So that could have been, you know, travel from from any of those places to the U.S. But what I'm saying is that that within weeks, cases were turning up of people who clearly had gotten in a exactly. linear fashion right. from somewhere else, but but even, weren't even necessarily being tested or suspected because they hadn't been in Wuhan, right? So you know, we were <laughs> we were. Uh, not understanding and not basing this on the science. And, uh, and of course, at the time, this nobody could have known, but we didn't understand asymptomatic transmission. So we were doing a lot of fever screening, right? Looking for people with fever. Well, turns out you can have this virus, be shedding it, be very infectious for others and not have a fever. So, <laughs> you know, that, that we had to learn. Uh, and that has, of course, turned out to be uh, such an important part of this. It's also true that the countries that did better, New Zealand, Taiwan, there were a number of them, uh, really ramped up testing. And we, of course, flubbed the early part of testing, and we still aren't doing enough testing. So I was on a call with, with a global group. There were lots of people uh, at this. It was in May uh, of last year. And a South African epidemiologist, who's a very, very good scientist, said, uh, I don't know if you've seen the reports from Europe, but the Europeans are doing global estimates. And they say that the United States does not have, we had about that time, 20,000 cases. Uh, I said, it's not 20,000, it's 200,000. Because you are so underestimating how much disease transmission there is. And at the time, the worst case scenario for the U.S. was that we might have 200,000 dead. Mm -hmm. I remember. Yeah. So uh, the South Africans were right. <laughs> <laughs> and we were wrong. Uh, and that is just extraordinary. Um, I think when you look at what happened this last fall and winter, uh, we were all predicting this, I'm sorry to say, because 
First of all, it's true of respiratory viruses uh, in general that uh, they do better and they linger longer in colder, drier air. So we were worried about Northern Hemisphere winter. Secondly, it was very clear early on from China uh, and then subsequently that there's actually very little outdoor spread of this virus. And almost all of it is indoors. Oh. So of course what happens in the cold weather is that people go indoors. So, you know, that's, <laughs> that's a major driver. And of course, then they're, you know, interacting uh, in indoor environments. The other thing that, that was always a concern was that there are two different kinds of respiratory spread. So there's droplet spread, which is, you know, the kind of big droplets that happen when people sneeze or cough and tears, you know. Uh, and then there's aerosols, which are much smaller particles, drier, lighter. Uh, measles is the classic a childhood disease that spreads through aerosols. So, you know, a child can be coughing in the pediatrician's office and leave the room. And half an hour later, the next kid who comes into that room can get measles because the measles particles are light aerosols that linger in the air. So we started to be concerned, particularly in the nursing home context uh, about aerosol spread. There was a lot of debate about it. WHO didn't want to go there. Uh, yes, it does spread by aerosols uh, and aerosols also are favored by cold weather and indoors. So we had predicted that it was going to be a bad winter. I think nobody could have predicted that the basics of public health would be so politicized, uh, yeah. become an election era issue and that it would become a red state, blue state, partisan issue. Uh, and we are really paying the price for that. Yes. yes, yes. Oh, that, you know, the White House would become a super spreader event. <laughs> but it was. <laughs> well, I mean, this might be a juncture to comment on this whole notion that uh, Trump and the White House and the Republicans seem to embrace around herd uh, uh, immunity and the, the theory, just do nothing. And somehow there will be a spread and the public will develop its own uh, immune response as a herd. Um, what's your comment on that? I mean, obviously it didn't work and we've ended up with 500,000 dead. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what, what, how, did that, how did that get into the system and go so high in our political structure and influence so many? Yeah. It's such a profound lack of compassion. It's so incredibly uncaring. Yes. You know? And it's so profoundly devaluing the elderly. It's essentially making an argument that young people and their economic activity is more important than the lives of seniors, right? And we can afford to lose a couple of hundred thousand elderly people. Uh, and keep the economy going. Yeah, mostly people of color and the marginalized. It's, yeah. it's, it's, uh, I think that is at the heart of it. I think at the heart of it, you know, Donald Trump cannot even fake compassion. He, it's incredible. He can't even fake contrition, you know, and he was deliberately confronted about the 150,000 dead at one point, if you recall, this was during the campaign. He said, well, it is what it is. No, <laughs> you know, I know what it takes to recover from, uh, you know, the, the, the loss of a beloved spouse, partner. Um, no one should ever wish that on anyone. It's a part of life. We all, you know, there's no escape from suffering as the Buddha <laughs> taught us a long, long time ago. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, these kind of, you know, deaths are unnecessary suffering. They're affliction, right? They don't have to happen. And the preventable deaths uh, from infectious diseases are particularly cruel. I think the, the cruelest aspect of, of COVID really is that we can't be with our loved ones when they're passing and that people have died alone. Um, and, you know, with only cell phones and tablets to, to say goodbye. Um, and I think that that, 
at least partly has explained why the denialism, which just seems so beyond comprehension, um, took root in some communities because nobody can see it. I mean, you know, when, when AIDS was unfolding uh, in New York City, um, and I was a part of the gay community there, uh, San Francisco, LA, people will remember this. There were wasted people in wheelchairs, young men with KS lesions. Famously, there was a physician dying of KS who was on the cover of Time Magazine. You may remember that. He wanted people to see what this looked like. Yes, I remember. Breathtaking. But you know, with, with COVID-19, if you're not in healthcare, if you're not an intensivist, you don't see this. Um, and I think that that, that that has been important, you know, that it's, it's something that's been so burdensome for the people taking care of these folks. Uh, and it's a burden that's not shared by so many of the rest of us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's, let's talk a, a, a moment, Chris, about kind of the spawning of these variants mm -hmm. in relationship to the vaccines. Because uh, I think the world now is, you know, poised to kind of em embrace vaccinations. And then all of a sudden you've got all these variants popping up. And then there's, the I think, a confusion that's entering into the public consciousness around if I get vaccinated, uh, you mentioned earlier, that means to get a booster or if there's X variant or Y variant, you need a different kind of vaccine. So t uh, talk to us a little bit about the, I would say the, uh, what, how do these variants pop up? Mm -hmm. And then the history of the development of the vaccine and, and its, its purpose and its focus in terms right. of the public right. immunization. Well, let me just start by saying that if anybody thinks evolution is still a theory, <laughs> these, these variants uh, are proof positive, right? What these yeah. are is, of course, viral adaptations. And the reason the virus is being forced to adapt is because it's moving through human populations who are having immune responses. So we refer to these typically as escape mutants. They, they are, you know, the, the, one of the issues with particularly true of RNA viruses, SARS is an RNA virus, HIV is an RNA virus, uh, is that their replication system is error prone. The way they replicate is full of errors. And most of those errors render that particular virus non-viable. But it is just going to happen by sheer numbers. And remember that, you know, that people can have billions of viral particles when they're infected. So it's going to happen regularly uh, that the virus will mutate, that there will be these mutations. Sometimes they will accrue over time. Uh, and there's no question that uh, if one has an advantage, in other words, it's more infectious, it will spread faster if given the opportunity. And so what we've seen, for example, with that UK variant is by the time the Brits were aware that this thing was spreading, it was already kind of overtaking the older coronavirus uh, um, strains in particularly Southern England and London, and very quickly became the predominant virus overall. So uh, this is going to happen. Um, there is uh, uh, one concern um, that, that is just emerging. I, we're actually working on this right now, um, which is that it appears that one of the ways that these variants uh, are likely to emerge is people who have immu immune compromise. Um, for example, somebody on cancer chemotherapy. Uh, there was a, a well-described case here of a guy with an autoimmune disorder um, who just couldn't shake COVID. And he had three recurrences, uh, cleared the virus with aggressive treatment, came back, happened again. Uh, he had three recurrences, eventually died uh, uh, after the third recurrence. Um, but by the time he died, his virus had dramatically altered because of how many replication cycles. So we're, we're concerned about that. And we think that, that the important thing is that folks with immunocompromise 
need to be prioritized for immunization as fast as possible because they, they are at heightened risk of dying and also um, may, may play important roles in the generation of these variants. Um, that may have been what happened in Southern Africa, which is being taken over by the South African variant and where there are still unfortunately an enormous number of people with HIV disease that is untreated with untreated TB, uh, which is also immunocompromising. Uh, and there's food insecurity in a number of those places and food insecurity is also uh, immune compromising, micronutrient deficiency. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we've got to support those folks and we've got to do better with the earlier pandemics <laughs> and we've got to prioritize them, I think, for immunization. This is going to continue to happen because uh, the virus is continuing to circulate. This is why it's so important that we practice all the non-vaccine interventions while we're in this period where vaccine coverage is still too low. Uh, we have not in most countries in the world, of course, most of the world hasn't started immunizing at all and have a single dose of vaccine. Um, but where we do uh, see higher rates of immunization coverage, you do really start to see decline. So that's happening in Israel. Uh, it's happening in the UK. It's very encouraging. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we're, we're hopeful that uh, the Biden administration's focus on the rollout uh, is going to help us get there. It probably isn't going to be before June or July that we have enough uh, vaccine for everybody who wants it and we're able to deliver it. Um, and of course, these, these vaccines are right now only for adult use. Uh, the Pfizer vaccine can go down to age 16. Uh, the trials in, in uh, younger adolescents are, are just getting started. Um, and we obviously need to know if they are also safe and effective in kids. Yeah. And now the, the, these different kinds of vaccinations, uh, Moderna, uh, Pfizer, uh, the one in the UK, et cetera, are they all essentially the same? Well, the uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a very important question, Jim. There, there are essentially uh, several categories of vaccines. What they share is that they're all aimed at the same target. They're all aimed, coronavirus is named coronavirus because it has a crown of spikes, right? it has a corona of spikes. And that spike is the protein sticks out from the viral shell, the capsid it's called, um, that attaches to human cells. So the spike protein is the really important target. And if you can block that attachment uh, with antibodies uh, and with cellular responses, you can prevent, you can't prevent infection, but you prevent disease. These vaccines all reduce the risk of serious disease, hospitalization, and death. They do not, as far as we know now, prevent primary infection. And that's an important distinction because, um, you know, most of the transmission really is right around the nose, mouth and eyes, but mostly the nose. Uh, and it's very hard to get high antibody titers in the nose. That, that isn't how they're working. So you do get some infection there. And then if you're immunized, the body responds quickly. So the first two products uh, are the Pfizer and the Moderna. Uh, and they are both uh, what are called messenger RNA vaccines. So this is a technology that's been under development for about 20 years. And I remember when I was in my infectious disease training at Hopkins, people were talking about these vaccines. So they, you know, that's <laughs> some decades ago. Uh, but they didn't progress because basically when you uh, inject messenger RNA, it's degraded by the body very quickly and it didn't mount much of an immune response. There was a big technological breakthrough which required actually nanotechnology. Uh, and that is that if you can wrap the messenger RNA in fat, it's a lipid, phospholipid, um, a, a lipid nanoparticle, then it can get into the cell and there our ribosomes can read that piece of RNA, make the spike protein, express it on cells, and then the immune system recognizes, okay, that is foreign. It goes after, kills those cells and generates immune memory. So the next time you see the real virus, you're ready to go. The second class um, 
And by the way, uh, the person who led that effort at the NIH uh, is a 35 year old African American woman uh, who went to the University of Maryland, Baltimore County for undergrad uh, and got a PhD at University of North Carolina. Kismekia Corbett, remember that name because she's going to get the Nobel Prize. And, uh, <laughs> and she is an <laughs> she's an incredible young woman, uh, just brilliant scientist. Um, the second group are what are called live vectored vaccines. So in, in that case, you take a, a, a harmless virus or an attenuated virus, and you insert the spike protein from COVID uh, into that virus. Um, so the AstraZeneca vaccine, it's often called the Oxford vaccine. Uh, that's what's being used in the UK, it's being used in a number of countries now. Um, uh, this is the vaccine that, that looked like it wasn't uh, so effective against the South African variant. So this is one of the vaccines where we're concerned about the variants. Uh, but that uses a, um, a virus, it's called an adenovirus that actually causes the common cold in chimpanzees. Uh, and it doesn't replicate in humans. It goes through one replication cycle and dies. So uh, you take that virus, you put in the spike protein. The third category uh, is uh, old technology that's been around for a long time. A lot of the kids' vaccines are made with this, and that's just a pure protein subunit vaccine. Uh, so we are testing one of those right now, um, a trial um, that was incredibly enough at the height of our epidemic was enrolling about a thousand Americans a day. Just incredible how many people have volunteered and stepped up to participate in these trials. And that vaccine, um, it's made by a company called Novavax, um, is, we hope is gonna be a lot easier to use. The other vaccine, uh, which actually is going to have a hearing at the FDA um, this week, it's February 26th, is Johnson & Johnson's vaccine. Uh, it's also called the Janssen, that's their vaccine sub, subgroup. Uh, and that, uh, is, has a number of advantages. That's another vectored vaccine. It's with another adenovirus, uh, but it's a single dose. So it's a one dose product and it doesn't have to be super cold. Uh, the Pfizer product has to be stored at temperatures that are basically Antarctic winter, minus 80. Uh, this can be stored in ordinary refrigerator and it's a single dose vaccine. Uh, it's looked very good in the trials. We haven't seen the data. The data will become public on the 25th. Uh, and then on the 26th, there'll be the hearing. Um, and these are live. Uh, if, if anybody's interested, uh, I watched the hearing for uh, Pfizer and Moderna live, and it was, um, it was a great moment in American science. I got to tell you. Um, and having worked on HIV vaccines for more than 30 years and never gotten one, <laughs> It's pretty remarkable that the first two out of the gate were both efficacious and safe. And how do you account for that? Because I know that was in such defiance of the conventional wisdom yeah. about how long it takes vaccines to be developed. HIV, they never did quite get one together. No. How, how do you explain the speed with which these vaccines um, materialized? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the first thing to say is um, we've done a lot better with a lot of other diseases than HIV. So it's really HIV that is the outlier because it is a, a virus that targets the immune system, right? What it stands for, HIV, is the human immunodeficiency virus, right? It causes immune deficiency, uh, which is how it kills you. Um, and uh, so, that is really, really tough because you're trying to make a vaccine to stimulate the immune response against a virus that is attacking the immune response. And it's right. just proved to be devilishly difficult. Uh, the, uh, the innovations that allowed us to get to these messenger RNA vaccines for, for COVID so quickly, as I said, have been building for a number of years uh, and they were used to make effective vaccines against Ebola. So we knew uh, that they were out there and that, that, that there was this possibility. And Kizzy Corbett and her group at the NIH, as soon as that sequence of this virus was, was put online, 
we knew from the earlier SARS that the spike protein was, was the critical target. So we had the target, that's very important. Uh, they made the RNA transcript in less than two weeks. And then it had to be wrapped in the phospholipid nano, you know, in the lipid nanoparticle uh, and prepared. Uh, but so that allowed the trials to get going quickly. The thing that has really saved time in a unique way um, is uh, what's called Operation Warp Speed. And this was, um, of course, the, the joint effort of, um, of the NIH and, and uh, Department of Defense and the companies funded by the taxpayers, the Congress passed this in the first COVID relief bill, uh, that we would invest in manufacture of all five of these products that we've been talking about while the trials were underway. So if all five of these vaccines were a bust, they either were not efficacious or they weren't safe, we would have just lost that money. We would have made millions of doses of useless vaccine. But if any one of them was a hit uh, and was safe and effective, uh, that's then yeah. that's right, and you could go very quickly. So that's how, you know, and, and the US pre-purchased. We pre-purchased 600 million doses of vaccine. So uh, thank you taxpayers, for all of you who pay your taxes. <laughs> and, uh, and we didn't do the trials for Pfizer, but we pre-purchased that vaccine as well. Um, now, you know, the downside of this, I have to say, is that the rich countries in the world have basically bought up all the available supply and all the supply to come. And we now are facing this huge vaccine inequality yep. and inequity. And that's not just a moral issue, although it is a moral issue, and it's not just a, a human solidarity issue. Uh, it is also a scientific concern because you can't control a pandemic by just immunizing all the rich people, right? That will not work, quite the opposite. You will almost ensure that these variants will continue to emerge and they will continue to threaten uh, the vaccine protection. Uh, and so the only way out of this is what we've had to do with HIV, which is we, we have to come up with a new pricing structure. We have to consider these vaccines a global public good, and we have to make them available to all 7 billion people on this planet as soon as is humanly possible. Yeah. Now, Chris, uh, we're running to the end of the hour here, and I just want to broaden scope here just in closing to get uh, a more metaphysical uh, intuitive understanding. I remember reading an article uh, back during the AIDS uh, epidemic on the fact that these viruses have intelligence. They're not just chemical blobs that kind of that we were dealing with AIDS with an intelligent virus that had that protein capacity to adapt. And you're seeing it again with the coronavirus that we're, 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 we're being confronted in some fundamental way by nature uh, due to a large extent because of our mismanagement with the, 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 the wet markets and the species um, uh, despoilation and so forth and so on. So I'd like you to, as we close, just to expand or expound on your sense of, is the pandemic being afflicted on us by nature? Is it a wake up call? And I'm, I, I, I was very struck as many people were uh, by the connection between the pandemic, respiratory uh, disease, George Floyd dying, I can't breathe. That meme went worldwide. There were more protests around George Floyd than any single other event in the history of the world. I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd yeah. love to have you just yeah. Yeah. share with us your feelings about the the deeper, deeper meaning of what's happening to humanity on planet Earth right now. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's no question, it has to be said, that both this pandemic and the HIV pandemic uh, are 
outcomes of our um, uh, our very uh, dangerous relationship to the planet and to life itself. Right? Human society, human lives, because we are a part of nature, and you know we we evolved here and nowhere else. Uh, our lives entirely depend on the chain of life, and and that that the planet is healthy enough to sustain us. Uh, the destruction, habitat destruction, and encroachment on the remaining wild places, and our relationship of misuse and abuse uh, of the animal kingdom and, and all the other forms of life uh, are really at the heart of how this happened. There are many people uh, who thought a lot about this and think that actually uh, 7 billion people can sustainably live on this planet without destroying the systems of life itself that we depend on and must have vibrant and alive and intact for, for human flourishing and for flourishing of all the other species. But for that to happen, we have got to change. We cannot have a carbon-based economy, a global economy. We cannot destroy the remaining rainforests and wild areas. We cannot continue uh, to uh, uh, you know this extraordinary rate of extinction of species, uh, we we don't begin to understand the damage we are doing to these incredibly intricate webs of life that that have sustained us and out of which we have come. So I think that is very fundamental. And is it a wake up call? I sincerely hope so. There's no question, you know, that that the next generation, and particularly people under 30 and under 20, totally get this. They know that we cannot survive on this planet with this, with our continuing relationship to nature. I would also just say, uh, apropos of your, you know, your your comment about about viruses having intelligence. The fact is that viruses have played very important roles in evolution. Uh, harmful and hurtful. So for example, with, with us and chimpanzees, one of the ways that we know that our closest relative actually is the bonobo and not the greater chimpanzee is because of the retroviruses, HIV is a retrovirus, that we share and the ones that we don't. Because so much of our genome is made up of viruses from past pandemics. We are all the survivors of multiple, multiple pandemics. That, that is part of the reality. And I'll just give you one example of that. So, you know, there's only one organ in the human body uh, that is made up of two people, right? You know what I'm talking about? The placenta. The placenta of all mammals is made up of the mother, uh, and the fetus, right? And at that interface is what's called a syncytium, a, a breaking down of the individual separate cells into giant multinucleated cells, right? And that allows placental life, right? Uh, everything else is either marsupial or egg laying, which we are past. <laughs> so, you know, when you look at that syncytium, you think, God, it looks like a malignancy. It looks like your worst nightmare of a malignancy. Where did that come from? It turns out that the genes that allow for the creation of the placenta are from retroviral infections. Wow. At the beginning of mammalian life. So without retroviruses, no placenta, no mom, no baby. <laughs> and that is true for all mammals. So uh, yes, they, they play important roles in evolution. Uh, they exact a very high price uh, from us and have in the past. There also are benefits there um, that, that we only begin to understand. I think the thing that is so important about uh, particularly these, these mammal viruses like HIV and SARS, um, and it's true to some extent to the bird viruses too, like the avian influenza. Um, and of course, to antibiotic resistant bacteria, it's also true of bacteria from farm animals, is that our fundamentally exploitative and harmful relationship with other mammals constantly is going to put us at risk. 
mm. constantly, right? Factory farming, the mix of factory farmed animals with wildlife animals, it must cease and desist. <laughs> and you know, China has signed on to the CITES ban, but they don't honor it, right? And they have been accused by a number of wildlife groups uh, of continuing to traffic in pangolins. And they say, no, 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 we, we have a stockpile of dead pangolins. Uh, and the, the consensus is that that is not true, that they are continuing to traffic in these animals because the, the trade is so lucrative. So that fundamental relationship uh, is something we all have to work on. And uh, we actually, at the, I co-chaired the first international conference on SARS last summer. And we had as a keynote speaker, Jane Goodall, Mm. She said everything I just said in four minutes and way better. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to look at that talk, it's online. Uh, but but it is uh, it truly is remarkable. Yes. Well, when we inaugurated Humanity Rising last May 22nd, uh, she said essentially what you've been saying in four minutes. So, <laughs> well, Chris, I really want to thank you. I. Uh, I love the clarity of your mind. I mean, you have remarkably lucid intelligence, my friend, <laughs> with encyclopedic recall. So uh, I, uh, I want to really uh, uh, thank you for uh, just illuminating us on so many facets, because we're in a, you know, a, a complexity. Yes. Yes. That is, is very challenging to understand because it has so many moving parts. And, uh, and you've been uh, very, very uh, helpful, I think, to all of us. Uh, so I want to uh, really uh, honor your work and, and, uh, and, uh, and thank you for your contribution uh, today. Because all of us, uh, as you were just saying, know we need to radically rethink what it means to be human in this mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. And we need to move from an exploitative relationship to the environment to a regenerative yes. relationship uh, to the environment. And that's really the bottom line. That's the deep lesson of COVID, I think, uh, yep. when all is said and done. I think uh, that's so, absolutely uh, right. Thank you for that. And then tomorrow, everyone, we're going to delve into the singularly important issue of how we increase our immune responses. Uh, mm. Obviously, the vaccinations are, are one, but we're going to look at a number of, of uh, naturopathic ways of increasing our immune uh, responses. So that's tomorrow, uh, same time, same station on uh, Humanity Rising, uh, 5 o'clock p.m. Central European time. Uh, and for those of you who are interested in joining our after uh, session chat for a deeper uh, dialogue, uh, you'll see the link in our chat box. So we'll see you all uh, tomorrow uh, back here on Humanity Rising. And Chris, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. It's been a real pleasure and, and thanks to the audience. I saw that through most of the talk, the participants were 108, which is the number of completion in Buddhism. <laughs> <laughs> the number of beads on a Buddhist mala. So um, I feel very connected to all 108 of you. <laughs> Good. All right, everyone, see you tomorrow. Thank you, Chris. Surely. Bye. All right.